This is the Big Issues Better Pod. Acting today for a better tomorrow. I really believe that what we've seen in the last two years is evidence of institutional misogyny, institutional racism within the police force. And you can't, in my view, detach that from the fact that the system is completely failing women and survivors of sexual violence. Laura Bates is the founder of the revolutionary Everyday Sexism Project. For the last decade, the website has provided a space for women to speak up about their experiences of sexism. Laura's latest book, Fix the System, Not the Women, exposes the ways that women are blamed for the violence and oppression inflicted upon us. Laura argues that this blame game has distracted us from the real problem, the feelings and biases of a society that just wasn't built for women. In this edition of Better Pod, we discuss the solutions that already exist to make the future better for women, if only they would be enacted. I'm Laura Kelly, Future Generations Editor at The Big Issue. I lead a team of exciting young journalists from backgrounds that are traditionally underrepresented in the media. I'm Eliza Pitkin and I'm a graduate of a scheme that The Big Issue did to bring in more diverse voices into journalism and recently I got made a full-time employee here as the social media journalist. So Eliza, tell me, what did you take away from our conversation with Laura Bates? I think the initial imprint is that it was super emotional and it really unearths this kind of anxiety and um, anger, but actually she was really good at sort of like Um, depositing lots of hope within that and and really pointing to where there is progression um, and reformation within these institutions. So I was left feeling motivated and really, really driven. Hi, Laura. Thanks for joining Eliza and me on Better Pods. Thanks for having me. So many of our listeners will already know you from the Everyday Sexism Project, and I'm sure we'll get onto that in the conversation, but I would really like to start by talking about your new book, Fix the System, Not the Women. The book starts with a list of your experiences of acts driven by misogyny, and they range from kind of the seemingly trivial to ones that are pretty major. I would like to start by asking you what that, why is that list important? I think it's important because as simple as it sounds, it's actually a radical act in a world in which we are absolutely indoctrinated from childhood not to make the list, not to join the dots, not to acknowledge those incidents, to allow ourselves to recognise that they are all connected and that they together represent systematic oppression. Because I think as women and girls from childhood, we are told, oh, you're overreacting. He didn't mean it like that. It's just boys being boys. He probably probably likes you. Take it as a compliment. Lighten up. Well, it was probably your own fault. What were you doing? Did you just not speak up loudly enough? I would have done this or that. Why didn't you respond in this way? Why didn't you leave? Were you leading him on? Had you been drinking? What were you wearing? There are literally a million ways that our society forces us to either ignore these events, to doubt ourselves, or to blame ourselves. And so for me, it was really important to start by saying, actually, if we allow women that radical space to recognise just how many of those incidents there have been. And of course, it will look so different for different people. For many people, the list will be compounded by racism, transphobia, homophobia, ableism, and so on. But allowing ourselves to recognise the connections that those weren't things that were minor or didn't matter or that were our own fault. We weren't imagining them. They were real and significant, I think is actually really significant in allowing ourselves to recognise it's not us, it's a system. Yeah, I loved the idea that you said in the book of the, the first most urgent act of resistance is to make your own list. And that, that I, I mean, I find that quite uh, transformational as an idea. Because I know from Me Too, uh, there was a lot of things that I had never talked about and you know, yeah. in, in the wake of the Everyday Sexism Project that I never admitted any of that stuff had happened to me. Um, so would you, I mean, it can be painful as well, though, for women to do that, right? So would, yeah. you, would you encourage people to, 
to give themselves the space to do that, even if it might hurt. Absolutely. I would say it's something to do at your own pace. One of the things that was really important to me in the book was to interview um, a clinical psychologist and include her advice on how to care for and support yourself as you do this. And one of the things she says is that if it is really painful, then support is out there and don't be afraid to access it, whether that's rape crisis, a helpline, whether it's, you know, counselling. And when I'm asking people to make this list, I think it's also important to say it's not asking them to share it. This is not about saying that we owe our trauma to anybody. We shouldn't have to go through the pain of publicly disclosing these things in order to force people to care. It's much more of a personal list that I'm talking about in terms of allowing yourself in your own time and space to have that reflection and to allow yourself the recognition, which absolutely I think can be very painful, but I also think can be very cathartic because I think it can be a freeing experience to recognize that when you see all these things together, you realize it couldn't have just been your own fault. It was something much bigger. And I think that can be quite healing as well. I recently wrote an article which was actually completely targeting bystanders of sexual harassment because the mayor of London obviously recently put out this campaign of like, you know, if you s- like see it, say something and it's your words. And I thought it was really interesting to kind of um, target the friends of people who sexually harass. And I think very often my, my most haunting experiences have been, like you mentioned in the book as well, being followed home, being catcalled, um, just general fear in public spaces. And very often I always find the most haunting aspect of it is the people that don't say anything. Um, and I know you even mentioned the books saying out loud what was happening to you in a public space and just no one getting involved in that discussion. So I'm really interested in this sort of next wave of accountability being aimed at people who aren't doing anything about it, um, because ultimately facilitating it is complying with it, um, in my opinion. Um, What would you say to that? And should we be angry about the fact that that isn't happening? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So much of our society focuses on women and victims. Well, what should she have done? Why didn't she leave? Why didn't she fight back? We even have horrifying stories of, you know, juries in right rape trials saying, well, she didn't fight back. She hasn't got any injuries, so I don't believe her. And these are just such incredibly damaging, pervasive myths when the reality is that we know no one can possibly imagine how they will react in that situation. We know from really good research that the body does sometimes freeze and shut down, and that's not your fault. The responsibility is not with victims, but just as you say, there's a really exciting potential for it to be uh, bystanders who are able to take action in those situations. And we don't talk about that enough. We focus so much on what women can do, and even the official response in our society focuses on that. You know, when Sarah Everard disappeared, police knocked on doors in Clapham and told women not to go out on their own at night. After Sabina Ness's murder, they handed out 200 attack alarms to women in the local area. Uh, They didn't stop men to talk to them. When Bobby Ann McLeod was murdered, her male city council leader said women shouldn't put themselves in compromising positions. We had a police and crime commissioner saying that Sarah Everard shouldn't have submitted to the false arrest. I mean, just horrendous things. And we've even got the police saying, well, perhaps women could flag down a bus. The lengths to which we will go to blame women are just completely crazy when we know that that's not the solution. And you're so right focusing on bystanders on the mates of men who do these things is really exciting and kind of powerful approach I think you mentioned there that the the kind of ways in which women's freedom are curtailed and yet when we when we fight back on that assumption for example you see a lot of times in social media go people saying well you know where are the men being told not to stay home so they don't accidentally rape someone you get this wonderful hashtag of the not all men yes (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which is um, terribly frustrating. Yeah. Um, but it, I mean, are we, is that evidence, I, I suppose, of a, of a double standard? Because I think people think that we're being playful in that or that we're being, or on the other end of the spectrum, they think that we're being shrill mm. when we do that. But is, I mean, is that actually, is there an equivalence there? Yeah, 
Yeah, of course there is. I mean, we are absolutely prepared in our society to take as a starting point an acceptance that all women's lives will be curtailed by this threat of male violence. And you're right, when police told women in Clapham not to go out at night, the response from so many people was, well, that just makes sense, isn't it? It's just common sense for women to be careful and to go out together. And people are really ready to accept that, that there is a degree to which women's lives inevitably must be constrained by this. But if we had said police have told men in Clapham they can't go out on their own because one of them's raping and murdering people we don't know who it is so they need to stay in pairs people would have been outraged by that and it's the same throughout the system we talk about women only train carriages all the time and people say well it just seems like a really good idea you know it might make women feel safer but what it says is male violence is inevitable we can't stop the men doing it we've just got to make the women inconvenienced instead and if we said right male violence is happening we need to put all the men in one train carriage because we can't trust them Again, people would be completely outraged by it. So it is a massive double standard. And the tragedy is that it also means that we focus on only the cases of women who our society deems to have been these perfect victims who did all the right things. And that's why it's a tragedy. In fact, she did all the right things was the thing that trended around the world after Sarah Everard's death, along with she was just walking home. When Ashling Murphy was murdered, the thing that trended millions of times, she was just going for a run. And I look, I understand that that came from a place of grief. I know that no one intended it in a bad way, but it is the context in which what our society is saying is these cases are tragic because these women didn't ask for it. And what we're really saying there, if you take it to its conclusion, is if she had been drunk or out at two o'clock in the morning or perhaps meeting a client for sex or drug doing drugs or whatever it was, then it would have been that little bit more inevitable or understandable that something had happened to her. That's what our society says. And we only focus in on these cases of these usually white, middle class, young, professional women. And it is only the tip of the iceberg. It prevents us seeing the whole picture. I um, It's so funny that you said that because I was thinking about the Sarah Everon case yesterday and actually thought in my head, because there wasn't there that thing that she was on the phone to hurt someone as she got pulled over. So that's something that I think so many women do, like be on the phone, be on the phone, you know, call someone to get home like so they're walking you home. And it's funny because even I was under the indoctrination of like, she did everything right. I would have done everything like that. And it, you're completely right. That's still the indoctrination. That I think we have to untangle from ourselves as women as well. Um, so the big question that I want to ask is that you mention in the book um, sort of these like potentially systemic fixes that are sitting there ignored and unused. If you could pick one that we could enact today, what would that be? Oh gosh, there are so many. Um, I mean, I think for me, perhaps the one that's at the heart of it all at the moment is real root and branch reform of policing. Because I really believe that what we've seen in the last two years is evidence of institutional misogyny, institutional racism within the police force. Um, you, you can't deny it when you look at the statistics. We have been repeatedly fobbed off and told that Wayne Cousins was a bad apple, that he was an aberration, that no one could have seen it coming. But the truth is that his colleagues nicknamed him the rapist, that actually he'd been three times reported for indecent exposure and somehow that hadn't been taken seriously enough to take him off duty. And the further you look into it, whether you look at the report recently into atrocities going on at Charing Cross Police Station with racism and misogyny and homophobia, but then you discover that nine out of those 14 officers involved in that report are still serving, or even bigger statistics that 2,000 Met police officers have been accused of sexual misconduct in a four-year period to 2020 alone. It's obviously a system issue, and not acknowledging that means that the culture within that system won't change. And you can't, in my view, detach that from the fact that the system is completely failing women and survivors of sexual violence. The fact that 1.4% of rapes reported to the police results in a charge or summons. And if you look at the number of rapes that are wrongly no-crimed by police, or if you look at the evidence of Charing Cross and you realise that those officers were sending each other messages saying things like, um, um, your missus loves it if you slap them around. They're biologically programmed to love that stuff. You start to think this isn't just one or two bad apples. This is a system problem. So for me, it would be absolute root and branch reform of that system. Coming up, the horrifying number of rapes reported in UK schools. Did you know you can get the big issues, award-winning journalism through your door every week? 
As a Better Pod listener, you can sign up to get a four week subscription to the best in news, politics, and culture for just £12. And we'll even throw in a stylish tote bag for free. Go to bigissue.com slash big pod to find out more. You've obviously been working in this space for a really long time now. Um, so I, I was wondering if there was stuff in the book that still shocked you because do you, does it kind of, do you become a little bit numb to some of it after a while? I don't think you can become numb to it because it is just so shocking and because it, it it's fresh and worse things are emerging all the time you know every time you think you've heard the worst of it for example hearing how many officers have been accused of sexual misconduct you think that's so devastating and then you go on to learn that um, over half of officers accused of sexual misconduct uh, who are found guilty keep their jobs in the Met Police so it just sort of gets worse and worse I think for me the most shocking thing perhaps about the book and the thing I think that a lot of people will find most shocking is the level of sexual abuse that's happening in schools because we like to think of schools as a safe space and yet the reality is that an average of one rape per day of the school term is being reported as happening inside UK schools and the reality is that a third of teenage girls say that they're sexually assaulted at school. Um, 80% of girls in the recent Ofsted survey said that sexual assault is just normal in their peer group, that they wouldn't think of reporting it. 90% said that they experienced frequent sexist name calling or unwanted explicit photos. So I think that acknowledging that there is an epidemic of sexual violence embedded in our education system is is so shocking. And yeah, you can't, I don't think anyone could ever become desensitised to something like that. It has been like a decade since you started the Everyday Sexism Project. So how has it changed your life for the good and and the bad? Um, Well, on a personal level, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Um, There are wonderful privileges that I have, you know, gained from it, being able to do a job that I really love, working with young people in schools, which I feel really very passionately about, feeling like I'm getting to make a difference. Um, I feel very honoured and that it's such a huge responsibility that so many women and girls have shared their stories and I just want to do them justice, really. Um, On the flip side, I can get 200 rape and death threats on a bad day in 24 hours. Um, I have a police, you know, install panic alarms in my house. Um, things, uh, people, people on the internet are, you know, discussing how to find me and murder me, and people will send me long, detailed emails describing what different knives they'd like to use to disembowel me with and what order they'll use them in. So it's, um, yeah, it's up and down. But what I feel really proud about is that you can point to specific changes that I know have come about because of the Everyday Sexism Project and I feel that that is such a testament to the courage and the power of those 200,000 survivors who've shared their stories with us because it hasn't just changed the public conversation it hasn't just given a sense of sisterhood and strength and support to those women we also have taken the stories that came from schoolgirls who are being sexually assaulted at school into parliament and used them alongside other women's organizations to convince mps and ministers to change the curriculum to put sexual consent and healthy relationships on the curriculum and that will make such a difference for the next generation we've used the stories from women on public transport to retrain thousands of transport police officers to change the way that they deal with sexual offenses on the transport network and you can see the difference that's made because it raised the reporting by about 30 percent so I feel that there's so much positive that's come out of it and there's so much to hold on to and so much to feel hopeful about well it's such important work you're doing I'm so sorry to hear about what you what the backlash is that is absolutely horrible and it must be really horrible so I'm really really sorry that you experienced that how do you not burn out ultimately you're driving that from a a space of of empathy I mean are there days that you just think nah yeah of course of course I'd be lying if I said that there weren't and you know I I really hope that we will reach a point where these threats and this abuse isn't the cost of doing this work because I just don't think it's good enough that at the moment 
you know, such a high proportion, over half of female MPs experience this kind of abuse. Women of colour get it far worse, disabled women, trans women. Diane Abbott, for example, receives over half of the abuse addressed towards all female politicians, which is a stunningly horrendous figure. So I think for me, the things that help are having a really good support network of other women working in this space who know what it feels like and go through the same thing. That's my lifeline really more than anything else. And allowing yourself to take breaks and allowing it to be okay if not everything is your responsibility to fight. But I also really profoundly hope that we will reach a point where women don't need those coping mechanisms to be able to try and fight for things to be better because it's just not good enough that we should have to keep teaching girls how to jump through these hoops and how to jump higher and higher over the hurdles you know I'm hoping that we'll take the hurdles out of their way yeah absolutely and I we're going to ask you one more question before we go on to our our traditional three um and I would like to leave us if possible on a on a message of hope because I think that um hope is so important to our ability to you know Eliza's talked to you about burnout it's so important to our ability to keep going so um I'd like you to, to either pick a person or a thing that um that has given you hope in the last I don't know in the last few months um one of my favorite favorite stories that gives me hope and the reason it gives me hope is because it shows I think that you can make change in a way that doesn't look traditional um, it doesn't have to be about signing a petition or going on a march if that's not your thing. Um, and the story is that a man who wrote into the Everyday Sexism Project and he said he'd been reading the stories and he'd been completely shocked by them. He just never thought about it before. And the thing that particularly struck him was what a huge impact street harassment had on women's lives, how scared it made them, the impact after the event. And he said, I, I decided that the next time I saw that happening, I was going to do something about it. And I had this grand plan of what that would look like, you know, some big speech with statistics and stuff. <laughs> And of course, a few days later, he was walking down the street and he saw some um, builders on a construction site shouting at two women ahead of him on the pavement. And they were shouting, get your tits out. And he said he completely panicked and froze. And all of those grand ideas flew out of his head. He forgot the statistics. The moment was passing. He was thinking, I've got to do something. And in a panic, he lifted up his T-shirt and showed them his instead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And actually... Yes, that is a standing round of applause for yeah. that moment. Brilliant. <laughs> it, it, it did the job, right? It sent the message. You're not doing it to me, so why are you doing it to them? So I think it, it can be small things and that's okay. Just to do the small things. And if we all do the small things, then we can make a big difference. Good for him. I like that. So as I say, we finish our podcast every time by asking each of our guests uh, a few questions to help our readers act for a better tomorrow. Eliza, please take it away. So what's one bit of advice you wish you'd known earlier? I wish I'd known what the law is on sexual assault in the UK, because when I was sexually assaulted on a bus, I never would have dreamed of using those words to describe it. And I think had I had that definition, it would have empowered me so much to know that actually it was a serious offence and I did have the right to feel really affected by it and it wasn't my fault. So I want people to know because there's a lot of confusion about this and a lot of things that people think sexual assault basically means rape. But the law says that if a person touches another person and it could be anywhere on their body, if the touching is sexual in nature, the person being touched doesn't consent and the person doing the touching doesn't have some reason to believe that they consent. That's sexual assault. So it covers so much of what's sent into the project. Someone grabbing your breasts, spanking, pinching, slapping, groping your bum, rubbing up behind you in a crowded tube carriage. It's sexual assault and it's serious. That's clear. Thank you. Yeah. The next question is, what's one piece of art that gives you hope for the future? I've been watching Unbelievable on Netflix and I really recommend it because I think it's a really good window. It's based on a true story, which many people will find very shocking. And it's a real window into just how devastatingly survivors can be failed by the system. Um, and, you know, it does. It gives me hope that art can help us to communicate that to people and to open people's eyes to things. Mm, great recommendation I just finished it 
Um, and what's one thing that our listeners could do today to make for a better tomorrow? Um, the Centre for Women's Justice is currently um, trying to campaign for a statutory wide ranging inquiry into police misogyny. Um, supporting that campaign, signing their petition, sending them a donation would be a really powerful thing specific to what we've discussed today that people could do to make a tangible difference. Thanks for listening to Better Pod. If you'd like to support us, please subscribe, leave a review and tell your friends. We're relying on word of mouth to bring people into our conversation and to help us all discover how we can act today for a better tomorrow. You can keep up with all the Big Issues reporting at bigissue.com, where you can also discover how to find your local vendor.